have always said we are what we are because of you because of your love and support and i hope you all are having a lot of clinical insights and clinical fun with, uh, with us in our eight year celebration so we are back again with our academic program on obesity and its management which is brought to you by incolas with uh, the collaboration with center for metabolic surgery and doc nexus so today's topic of discussion is a very interesting one so it has been known that obesity has become a worldwide public health problem of epidemic proportions and studies have shown that obesity may increase the risk of sexual dysfunction by 30 to 90% compared to those with normal weight poor sperm quality and decreased seminal sperm concentration are directly linked with higher body mass index so i'm very honored to introduce our speaker for the day dr kushal mittal who is also our the honorary secretary of acrsi he is the director of medicare hospital and super specialty consultant and has an experience of more than 30 years in the field he is a surgical gastroenterologist a proctologist a sexologist and a varicose vein surgeon dr uh, kushal has completed his studies from mln medical college allahabad and he's also uh, completed his fellowship program from iigs till date he has delivered more than 30 tv shows on male sexual health and is a known personality in the field of bariatric surgery he has been participating in various academic programs relating to male sexual health and obesity management and has participated in various national international conferences and has many research publications up to his name it's an honor to have you here sir i'll now request you to please start your session uh thank you rati one little change i don't do obesity surgery that's for raman uh, but everything else was okay uh, i'll just share my screen okay uh you can see my video uh, or my presentation hello yes yes Shalti and uh, he only evaded the question. He said, uh, "They're okay. They're okay." I said, "What happens uh, after you do surgery? After they lose weight, uh, they're fine. They're fine." But the answer was always evasive. Then I really went into it when he said to talk about this, and some facts were really uh, alarming. And I'm going to tell him and myself uh, and all of you about it. Now, what is happening is uh, this is the scale which is happening. uh you have bmis and those bmis i'm i'm talking about today are the ones which are above 35 that is extremely obese patients these are the people i'm actually addressing today now you have to understand obesity and sexual dysfunction are hand in hand it obesity is a major risk factor of metabolic syndrome vascular disease diabetes hypertension endothelial dysfunction androgen deficiency which all contribute to erectile dysfunction and that's the main problem we're talking about erectile dysfunction so obesity causes all these problems and because of that you have erectile dysfunction now 25% of obese exhibit metabolic syndrome uh, raman will tell you about it all the time in obesity there's a increased body mass bmi we know that we're talking about those about 5 uh, increase waist circumference increase waist to hip ratio so why is this important this is important because the higher it goes the there is more chances of erectile dysfunction in these patients now you have to see the title it says ed equals to ed now first ed is uh, endothelial dysfunction that means the dysfunction of the arterial wall now arterial wall dysfunction means these arteries are going to get narrow down later on and they will uh, not respond the way they're supposed to not dilate the way they're supposed to so obesity promotes inflammatory response and contributes to endothelial dysfunction the actual cause of erectile dysfunction and endothelial dysfunction leads to erectile dysfunction so ultimately it is about vascularity we're talking about vascularity where the problem is we need to question the patients regarding cardiac history and work up for cardiovascular factors when the patient says they have ed why 
If a patient has erectile dysfunction, there are 64% chances that he's going to have a MI in the next three years. How do we know this? Go backwards. All the male patients who have had MIs, you ask them, do you, do you have erectile dysfunction? And the 64% will say, yeah, I had it, you know, like three years back, or two years back, or one year back. So why is this happening? I'm telling you at this point, we're going to come back later to it. Ultimately, erectile dysfunction is because the blood is not reaching the penis. And when the blood doesn't reach, the reason is the arteries have become narrowed. When there's an endothelial dysfunction, it means the endothelial dysfunction of the whole body, not just the penis. Everything, wherever the blood supply is. Now, because the penile artery is of smaller caliber than the heart arteries, it will get blocked first or it will get narrowed first. And that, how will it manifest? The patient is going to have erectile dysfunction. That's why erectile dysfunction is so important. It is a marker. You have it, that means you may develop a cardiac problem in the subsequent years and you have to find out, do a cardiac worker at this time to know what's going on. Now, decreased sexual activity, nearly 40% of people seeking uh, to control weight confirm that uh, are asking that lack of sexual desire and often poor performance. They have low energy and erectile dysfunction. They have a negative feeling about themselves. They are obsessed with how they are looking. They keep, uh, they stop looking at the mirror. If they're going to a hotel and there's a mirror uh, on the wall, they will not look into it because they have a bad feeling about themselves. They fear ridicule and judgment. Physically, they are less mobile and leads to limitation in sex life. This poor self-image contributes in a big way to erectile dysfunction. They don't like the image of themselves. They want to, don't want to have that. They have a loss of sexual desire and they don't want to have sex. And that all is contributing to sexual dysfunction. So what about obesity and low testosterone? Where does testosterone come into all this? Both serum testosterone and lesser extent, free testosterone levels are decreased in obese men from 20 to 64%. So that means these obese men, if we get a serum testosterone done, you will see that the levels are low. And these levels are low are indicative that there's a problem going on. In a normal weight men, as they get older, their testosterone levels may decline about 1% per year after 30. So if you have an obese person, so they are low testosterone because of the obesity. And uh, as they get older, this works out to be more. Obese men are likely to have low testosterone. And low testosterone have more, uh, men with more low testosterone are likely to become obese. It goes hand in hand. Fat cells metabolize testosterone to estrogen and thereby lowering the testosterone levels. Obesity also reduces the level of sex hormone binding globulin, a protein that carries testosterone in blood. So less sex hormone binding globulin means less free testosterone. Now, what does low testosterone level do? It reduces the sexual desire or low libido, fewer spontaneous erections, and it causes erectile dysfunction. And what Dr. Raman is going to be talking about, it causes infertility. So signs of low testosterone level includes the changes in sleep pattern, difficulty in concentrating, lack of motivation, reduced muscle bulk and strength, decreased bone density, last breast in men, depression and fatigue. When I come to fatigue, an uh, interesting thing is, if you ever go to a party and you see all your relatives or friends are there and they're all about 40, 50 year males, so you see these people, they will doze off and talking to you. You're talking to them and you know, 10 minutes later, you see while talking to you, they're off to sleep or they have dinner, they're off to sleep on the chair itself. So they get fatigued faster when your testosterone levels are low. Now, obesity and sexual desire. Now I put this do not disturb is that they don't want to be disturbed because they just want to be left alone. They don't want to talk about sex. The desire is less. 30% of obese people seeking controlling their weight because of problems in just a second uh, with sex drive performance and all three as tiny arteries in the penis begin to shut down when the vessel clogging fatty deposits begin to form erectile dysfunction is often sorry about that okay sorry 
And tiny arteries in the penis began to shut down. That's what I was saying. The, these arteries are the first one to shut down. The vessels uh, uh, clogging fat deposits begin to form and atrial function is often the result. So determining sexual dysfunction, clinical symptoms of hypogonadism plus low testosterone levels occurs in 14% of men with type 2 diabetes. Now, there's something which happens which we don't realize and uh, uh, Raman is sitting here and he uh, he's managing all uh, obese patients. So I'm going to ask him, uh, next time you see an obese patient, Try to see his genitalia and see what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, complications related to buried penis. These patients, because they're gaining fat, so for every 17 kgs weight gain, that means every time they increase 17 kgs beyond what is their supposed to normal weight. So if they are 34 kgs above weight, they will lose subjectively two inches. For 17 inches, you lose one inch. That inch is not gone. It's just buried in the fat. So these obese patients who are like 150 kgs, they, you cannot see the penis because it's all buried inside the fat. Now what happens because of this, they're unable to urinate while standing or even when sitting without getting drops of urine on the skin of scrotum, thighs, and clothes. Now this causes infection, infections in the urinary tract, genitalia area due to constantly being moist skin. In men who are not circumscribed, the propuse may become inflamed. They, it may stop going back. It may cause pain. It may cause pelonitis, that is infection of the glands. Uh, patients uh, would be in acne all the time. Many men are unable to get an erection, and if they get an erection, it may be painful because of all of this. Or it may not be able to penetrate the vagina because of the length has been reduced. Now, in erection, you may see a bit of it outside, but actually, suppose an average length on erection is about six inches. These patients, every time they gain 17 kgs, that comes down by one inch every time. So if they're undergoing surgery, bariatric surgery, they have to cheers for them because the more weight they lose, the larger the penis will become. Actually, it doesn't become large. It stays the same size. Psychological problems is there because of low self-esteem and they are depressed. Now, there's something which we must realize is we don't think from the patient's point of view. Do you know that the patient has not seen by himself? I'm not saying in the mirror by himself his penis for many years now because of that and the skin not going back or not being pulled out and he's never seen it visually because of the way there's a chance of missing out on cancer lesions uh, in the penis just because the patient cannot see now <clears throat> there's an international index of erectile dysfunction which i would request dr raman to apply to all these patients these are very simple questions and believe me the patients will be happy to answer them because nobody, nobody is asking them. No one. They go to their general practitioners, they don't ask them. They go to the surgeon, they don't ask them. They go to a bariatric surgeon who's who's absolutely interested in everything about that patient except the sexuality. And I think this is time that we, because of this talk, we should start. So there are five things you have to ask about. Erectile dysfunction, the total score is five for each. So erectile dysfunction includes ability to achieve erection, frequency of erection, frequency of penetration, ability to maintain erection after penetration, ability to maintain erection after sexual intercourse, confidence in getting and maintaining. Very simple questions which the patient can actually fill a form and write it down and they should do it themselves. They should not give it to their relatives to fill in the form. And it should be in multiple languages so the patient understands and somebody help them. Orgasmic function. So frequency of ejaculation, frequency of orgasms, sexual desire, frequency of sexual desire, level of sexual desire, intercourse satisfaction, so and the overall satisfaction. All these questions are important and pertinent. And my request to Dr. Naman is to start doing this because whenever you compare a drug, like if you're going to compare a drug as Ridenafil to Tadalafil, you need this chart to tell you which one is working good. Now enhancing libido. The simplest way you can enhance libido is lose a little weight. Even 5 kgs will work to stimulate the sex hormones. Eat more nutritious food, control cholesterol and blood sugar levels. Key to your workouts of getting blood flow in the pelvic area. Accept your body image at any size. This is one of the biggest obstacles to enjoying sex at any size. Believing in your sensuality. 
any activity that increases the blood flow to the large muscle groups. Which muscle groups am I talking about? Uh, the muscles of the thigh, the buttocks, and the pelvis. So simple things like yoga, brisk walking, cycling for 20 minutes three times a week will improve the circulation to the genital region. Now, patients who actually come out and talk. Uh, how do I know these patients? I don't operate, I do obesity surgery, but I have patients who have other surgical problems and those who are obese, they've come for something else and I ask them, how is your sexual desire? Are you able to have sex? And you will not believe it. Everybody has a problem, everybody. And the reason they're not talking about it is because they feel it's wrong. They feel that uh, larger size people should not have sex. That's what they feel, ke, this is probably what people are thinking in the uh, company. Now, these positions are available on the net. I'm not going to be going in detail, but I'm going to tell you something interesting. You have to understand the problem in sex is the large abdomen in both the partners or one of the partners. Now, this large abdomen in the male, when he's trying to do a missionary position, that is the lady is on the bottom and he's on top, it gets in the way and he's unable to approach his uh, area, that is the vagina. Now, the only thing, really small, small things they can do. See here, I'm showing with the arrow, the pillow. The pillow kept under the woman's buttocks is going to elevate it, and he cannot lie on top. He has to be in a red position. That means look at the position of the male. It's a missionary position, but he is semi-reclined. When you do this, the abdomen does not go on your partner. If he actually goes on top of it, the uh, patient, the person, the, his wife below is going to suffocate. So it's easy to have sex. All heavyweight people can have sex. These are the various positions, uh, missionary uh, position by keeping pillows below, woman on top because she has control, doggy style that is from the back. Uh, they can use pillows here again to balance and try to increase the strength. Spooning is the best, that is, uh, the wife is in front, the man is from behind, and he's having uh, penovaginal sex. It's good because it, there's a lot, a lot of intimacy. And the butterfly is when the lady is at a higher level, that means, uh, for instance, a table or a higher bed, and the man is standing and doing it. These are the standard five, only standard five positions which are recommended for obese people. You can find it on the net, and you can see it. They're very uh, typical things. Uh, uh, small, small things you can do to alter your position, your entry, and it will work. And please do not feel that obese patients cannot have sex. They have difficulty, but they get around it. And I'm just telling you the way they can get around it. Now, we need to treat this low testosterone level. Testosterone replacement therapy is used for men with low testosterone levels for ED and low libido. In hypogonadal, that means when the gonads are not working, the testosterone levels are less. It is favorable effect on the body composition, insulin sensitivity, lipids, and hypertension. Good reports. In testosterone deficiency is connected to insulin resistance, obesity, and diabetes. Each of these problems increases cardiovascular risk. Men with diabetes and low testosterone levels have higher rates of atherosclerosis on hardening of the arteries. And these patients who are diabetic, have low testosterone, and are obese, you can understand what problem there is going to be. Now, what do we do as a replacement? In India, we have injection capsules and gel. My recommendation on my experience is injections are the best because capsules, you have to take two to three a day and you tend to forget doses. Gel. Uh, can interfere with intimacy when you have applied gel and when you are with your wife and your she comes in contact with that gel, that gel is transferred to her. So that can cause a problem. Injections are good because you take it either once in three weeks or once in three months, depending on the dose. So erectile dysfunction drugs in low testosterone. Erectile dysfunction drugs encourage erection by increasing blood flow to penis. Now, let me clear up a fundamental which people think. Uh, let me talk about Viagra. Viagra is nothing but sildenafil. People have this misconception that it increases the size of the penis to really big size. No, it is only doing a vasodilatation. That means it is only dilating the artery. It cannot give you a bigger erection than a normal erection. So people who don't have erection, it gives a normal erection. Uh, erection. People have a normal reaction, erection, they take Viagra, they will not feel uh, much difference except they'll have a headache. 
some men with low testosterone don't respond to these drugs without undergoing testosterone, uh, testosterone replacement test. That means I have these obese patients who come to me and I said, do you take it? Well, like, yeah, I got the that Viagra like pill, but you know, even with that, uh, very poor response, very poor. So I get a serum testosterone done and the testosterone levels are low. If you correct the testosterone level, this very drug will act very well. Directions and improvements that result from PRT may not last over long term. Treating low testosterone level improves a man's sexual life by restoring libido and brightening their mood and renewing interest in sex. Now, injectable testosterone is available as Sustenone or uh, Cernos. Sustenone is 250 milligram in uh, 1 ml. You have to give deep IM and repeat the dosage after 3 weeks. And Cernos Depot is 1000 milligram in 4 ml and you have to give it once in 3 months. So once you know the patient is on this drug, I start with Sustenon, give a couple of injections, they're okay. They say they can't come every 3 weeks and you give it every 3 months, larger dose. And you have a uh, gel, gel comes in a 5 uh, gram sachet and it has to be applied locally. Oral capsules are available which have to be given 2-3 to three times a day along with the meals, uh, 1 in the morning, 2 in the night. Uh, Whenever there's a test on peak, it adds to it. But believe me, my experience, uh, patients forget to take it uh, on a regular basis. If testosterone levels, uh, if low testosterone levels affect the life, the sexual drive could go down and the patient might develop erectile dysfunction. This is to repeat and tell you. For men who have low testosterone levels, TRT has a better track record of restoring a man's sexual desire and overcoming erectile dysfunction. Now, I'm coming to the last slides. What do, what are the PDE5 inhibitors? That is sildenafil-like structures. One is Avanafil, which has just come to India. It's called Avanex by Zydus, 100 milligrams you have to give one hour before sex. Sildenafil, which is like Viagra or Penigra, 100 milligrams you have to give half an hour before sex. Tadalafil, that is Cialis and Tazel, 20 milligrams you have to give half an hour before sex. And Vernafil, uh, 10 milligrams again uh, half an hour. So other high for when patients say it doesn't work, so I give them one hour. Half an hour to one hour is the range before sex. They have to take this, and it's going to help. And uh, obesity. This is the last slide. Effect of body weight on sexual dysfunction in men and women. Obesity, sexual dysfunction by insulin resistance. This is uh, actually telling me overall what I'm trying to say. Sex hormone region, derangement, peripheral vascular disease, low-grade systemic inflammation, depression, sleep apnea, medication for disorders associated with obesity that is antidepressant, antihypertensive, and you know that these drugs themselves cause erectile dysfunction, antidepressants and antihypertensives. More research is needed to determine if bariatric surgery alone or the weight loss resulting from bariatric surgery is a driver for improvement in sexual dysfunction in these patients. And that's the message I want to give to all of you and to Dr. Raman in particular to go into the depths and find out whether sexual dysfunction can be improved by the bariatric surgery and weight loss. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kushal. I think a very pressing topic and a very interesting one, one of its kind. And uh, so if I may, we have some questions from the audience. Yeah. So, so, uh, the, so first the first question first... that came along was, as you said, impairments in sexual behavior may be the result of body weight dissatisfaction or depression. So how yeah. can a person on antidepressants get rid of this cycle of obesity, depression, antidepressants and obesity? Like, uh, like Yeah, the patient has to go in to get his weight loss done. And weight loss when these patients are morbidly obese is very difficult to manage by diet or exercise because they will regain the weight the moment uh, they leave it. It's best to go in for uh, obesity, subbariatric surgery, and uh, that is how they do it. Now, when you talk about antidepressants, it's uh, uh, almost every single antidepressant uh, has an uh, effect on erectile dysfunction. And major drugs used in the hypertension also cause depression of this uh, problem. The, may, many cardiac drugs are also causing erectile dysfunction. So you, you are stuck in a cycle. You have to break from that cycle. I think Raman is the right person uh, to go to for a problem like that. Thank Next you week. for the answer.
so we have a question which is not directly related to male sexual health but more to diabetes so i'll still read it out to you one uh, so the question is that what are your views on uh, electromagnetic force now which is rampant all over india and causing diabetes uh, <laughs> you know uh, that's a, that's a big problem i i had a our society meeting uh, uh, on sunday and we had a big tussle because they wanted the radio towers on top of the building and we are a hospital under that building and they wanted it on the seventh floor and then again what you said electromagnetic waves yes they cause a lot of problem and we don't realize it uh, we're sleeping with the mobile phone within one feet of our head when we're going to bed that's one of the biggest electromagnetic forces which can be there so we need to keep it at least a meter away so yes there is a big effect but no nobody is ready to accept it these radio tower people have people have gone to the supreme court and lost in the supreme court because they could not subjectively really find out whether it was causing a problem but long term studies have said that they are causing brain tumors glioma's are the commonest thing they cause yes there is a problem thank you so much i think dr raman what do you have raman, to ask you want to ask something i'm sure yeah uh thanks dr onnati so dr kushal mittal is a very close friend and uh, we have been brainstorming on this important issue for years and i i have heard his talks many times and he brings so much information uh, about this talk and uh, the main issues is still remain unanswered because majority of the family physicians i don't believe are starting are identifying testosterone deficiency i'm not talking about bariatric surgery here i'm talking in general when patients are coming uh, obese people or senior citizen are coming with the with the uh, one thing is that these questions are never asked and uh, how many of the family physicians actually get the testosterone level done and how many of them supplement that so kushal do you have any i mean you take lectures everywhere do you have any idea that is it is it being taught is it being practiced now uh, raman you actually have caught a very sensitive point and even in that talk i forgot to tell you that you have to get the serum testosterone done in the morning between 8 to 10 o'clock because there's a highest level of testosterone in the body at that time so we know your peak yes uh, people have started where i have given a lecture they have started because they suddenly have become aware that a something like a serum testosterone needs to be done now i tell them if the patient is hypothyroid will you not replace it would you let the patient keep suffering for hypothyroid now if the patient is got low testosterone you need to replace you will see that patient change in a month's time the patient is not going to be the same person again uh, how you want to know what happens with low testosterone have those see those patients who have had uh, prostate cancer and they've had orchidic with both the testes taken out see them they're like the dead souls walking because the energy is sort of sap all that energy i mean it's not just for sex all that energy is sap and uh, this uh, testosterone level also falls in women who obese women uh, because for them also sexual desire is governed by serum testosterone but i agree with you totally people are not aware and they're not doing it they don't even know what it is uh, if everybody can know about thyroid they should know about this that's how important it is so how do you how do you say that you know uh, if somebody is given testosterone uh, when when it has gone down with the age uh, does it have the downsides of it i mean obviously you the know, obviously there is a reason for prostate function to go down after at a certain age see so, the testosterone levels uh, people say if you are going to give testosterone levels you have to examine the prostate every 6 months to 1 year because one of the problems it can have is uh, ca prostate and ca breast in males now you know there is something which is theoretical and there is something which is practical so like uh, like overlay uh, uh, hormonal pills for women Uh, who don't want to have pregnancy they they cause a lot of cas of uh, uh, uterus cervix and ca breast and thromboembolism but actually have you ever seen it it's so many con with hundreds and thousands millions of uh, causes they need to be replaced replacing it changes everything changes their life it's not just about sex just to not drive the human body so that driver is out of the seat driver is less 
so unique to the place. So, I have personal experience, so I'm telling you. Okay, so I'm not asking for your personal experience. <laughs> Kushal, what happens in terms of uh, that if there is somebody who is morbidly obese, then we know that most of them have low testosterone. Now, if the person is not losing weight, will supplementing a testosterone will help him or will that go into adipose cells and that will get sequestered? No, no, two things will happen. Yeah. Uh, one, his sexual desire will improve. Uh, second, his visceral uh, obesity will become less. But that less becomes so little that it may not make a difference to... It's not a way to lose weight, but it is a way to increase the sexual desire. No, it's not going to get lost in that uh, adipose tissue, as you say. But in fact, it's going to decrease the adipose tissue. But the marginal decrease will really not count to that huge amount of uh, extra fat they have. So they need to go in for some other thing. They need to go in for, perhaps for a surgery or a really uh, way to lose weight. Uh, if they lose, uh, I started with 5 kgs, but if you lose 10% of your weight, whatever weight you are, you will see a marked difference in sexuality and everything else will start returning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Doctor. Okay. Thank you, Raman. So, sir, one small thing from my end. So, like, you know that this program is targeted for mainly for family physicians. So, what is your take-home message? For my take-home message is please do not uh, ignore the sexuality of every patient. Just don't think about uh, patients who are obese. Male patients... Uh, patients who are above 40 years old, ask them, is your sexual history okay? Just asking that much. They'll jump to it. I'm telling you, they'll jump to it. Family patients, they will realize and will be in the shop. The moment say, uh, do you have any problem in sex? And the patient will start saying, I have this problem, I have that problem. Because he's so shy. I have patients who will come for two visits saying, maybe I forgot to ask them. And the third way, that's a problem. So I said, problem was the first time, but the first time was the first time, the first time was the first So it was my fault. I should have picked that up. So we need to ask, why, why are we so shy in talking about sex? After all, the human race is propagating because of sex. If there was no sex, no, <laughs> there will be no life on earth. So we should not be shy. Uh, see, when you think about sex and talk about sex, we are not talk, able to talk because we think about the ultimate, the person having sex. So if you talk in normal anatomy terms, penis, vagina, sexual act, they're all clean. So talk cleanly. Don't get uh, wavered. And you can manage the patients. Very I teach well. schools. I teach in schools, so you can understand how careful I have to that uh, tight rope when I'm talking to young uh, young people in schools. Okay, thank you. Very well said, sir. Very well said. So, thank you uh, again, sir, for taking up the time. Thank you again for doing this. It was completely an honor to have you here. And uh, so, passing on the dice to Dr. Raman. Dr. Raman, can you please start your presentation? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Nati, for uh, this uh, platform because. I think this is this is such an important issue that we are discussing today. We have been conducting these webinars for almost uh, three months now, and this is the uh, this is such an important issue to discuss male fertility uh, because most of the time, even in IVF clinics and hospitals or in uh, wherever there is an infertility discussed, it's about the woman. The woman and, uh, there is not so much about the the male infertility or male fertility or what role it plays. So Dr. Kushal Mittal spoke about the, the male sexual dysfunction. I'll be talking a little bit about male fertility today uh, in few yeah. slides and how male surgery impacts it. So greetings for, from Center for Metabolic Surgery. And uh, uh, I'm at Vokard Hospital, Hindu Jain Zen Hospital, as uh, many of you know that. The important thing to realize, which Dr. Kushal Mittal has already highlighted, is that when the obesity increases, there is an increase on, in, uh, uh, there is a decreased total testosterone. And more important than that is, there is a free testosterone level goes down. 
and because the the serum hormone binding globulin is down because it's produced less by the liver from a fatty liver less of the globulin is being produced and this is directly correlated with the bmi as the bmi keeps increasing these hormones keep decreasing and if we see the evidence in reverse when patients lose weight then the testosterone levels go up the free testosterone levels go up and also the globulin produced by liver also goes up so is both ways it's an established fact and these are the studies which i have quoted which shows that how obesity impacts the the sex hormones of in a man now there are multiple studies done on this uh, topic the important thing to realize is there is there is significant improvement in sex hormones in all male patients in all the all these studies and there is a reduction in the estradiol levels there is a increased uh, in, uh, when the patient loses weight there is a increased total testosterone and uh, free testosterone level and reduction in estrogen levels now this is especially so in uh, in a younger men so if they lose weight there is a greater increase so if the patient is less than 35 years the effect of weight loss on their sex hormone is much better than in those men above 35 years and this is important because this is the age when these men are looking at completing their families or or having a child so this is important in terms of fertility here i am talking more more in terms of fertility is probably important for everyone but it's more important in terms of fertility in a young man and that's important now if we do a bariatric surgery then what impact it has so bariatric surgery as we know leads to loss of adipose cells or shrinkage of adipose cells and adipose cells when they shrink there is a release of testosterone hormone in the blood and that leads to restoration of natural hormonal balance and this is very important because this is possible only when we do a when when the person is losing weight gradually now if we do lipectomy this doesn't happen this is a hormonal impact of bariatric surgery and it is not a removal of Uh, uh, fat cells and uh, th this is important to realize that bariatric surgery has a direct impact dr koshal mittal asked me this question does bariatric surgery has a direct impact yes it has direct impact because this is seen only when the person has lost substantial weight after bariatric surgery and the hormone levels change and the balance is restored now what is the impact of bariatric surgery on spermatogenesis or sperms now this is seen that the even in patients who's who are azoospermic that means they have no sperms or who have very few sperms or who are oligozoospermic the the counts can become normal after bariatric surgery so there are uh, there is a significant improvement after bariatric surgery especially in patients who has oligozoospermic the increase does not happen in patients who have normal sperm counts so this is this impact is especially restricted to patients who are azoospermic or oligozoospermic now similarly sperm viability and volumes are significantly improved after the surgery versus the control group control means the same same bmi patients who are managed without surgery the sperm viability and uh, volume so so bariatric surgery has a direct impact on the on the quantity of sperms produced and the quality of sperms that are produced after after the person has lost weight with bariatric surgery now he has already spoken about erectile function but what is the impact of bariatric surgery on erectile function it is seen that after bariatric surgery there is a positive association between the surgery and patient sexual quality of life now that could be because of the the physical barriers are removed and it is it's established with multiple studies that the erectile function improves within 2 years after the surgery compared to the control group that means same 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 bmi patients who are managed medically or on 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 conservative measures 
so to briefly conclude this talk we know that obesity is rapidly increasing worldwide it has almost reached a epidemic proportion uh, all over the world obese men are more likely to be infertile a very important study has come out which shows the metabolic memory of a man's obesity at the time of conception so if a person is morbidly obese and is metabolically deranged which could be diet which could be metabolic syndrome which could be um, a pcod in a woman's let's sorry and all these could be transmitted to his offspring through his sperm this is called epigenetic that means the environment affects the genetic transmission and this has been seen not only in one generation this is presumed to be there in two to three generation that means uh, if person is metabolically deranged when uh, when they are conceiving a child uh, the they not only his son but even his grandson may be affected because because of his uh, obesity at that time so based on this now there is a discussion happening in scientific world that should we establish protocols that men should lose weight before they plan a family because so as to improve their next generation's health and it's it's an important thing Be, just to conclude that bariatric surgery helps especially the esophagic or oligosophagic men through hormonal changes besides physical alterations uh just a brief reminder that bariatric surgery is now accepted in this country not only by central government but by all large corporates and all insurance companies for cashless treatment so almost 80% of our patients now get surgery done through cashless route and uh, which 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 is a big relief for patients because they don't need to pay just like all other surgical methods and bariatric surgery remains the only treatment modality of obesity which is paid by insurance uh this is my operating room which i always like to show off because it's it's a wonderful place to work at wokard hospital and you can reach out to us i'll be very happy to uh, receive calls from the family physicians about this important uh, discussion and uh, to continue this discussion and to supply references to whatever i have talked to you so that you can read those articles yourself so thank you so much and i'll be happy to answer questions if there are any thank you thank you dr raman i think another wonderful session and one very needed one i think you just uh, reinforced dr kushal session whatever he told and it was just i think an addition a value addition of the same so uh, i do not have any other questions for the day sir we do have any other, i'll i'll do post them to you if they come on later so but we do have someone very special with us and we have a patient mr uh, gan krupesh ganakar so he uh, agreed to come and talk about you know all the issues he faced when he was obese and what led him to uh, do the bariatric surgery and uh, how is his health now so his his uh, speech is also like his his version is also around his uh, problems while he so uh, this is for dr kushal so this patient whose testimonial we are going to play now so he is one of those patients who was having uh, issues with their sexual life you know before uh, the bariatric surgery when they were obese and now he is very beautifully depicted that how it's going to be so can we have uh, our patient mr krupesh Hello, all. good afternoon. I'm Krupesh Ganatra, <clears throat> based in Thane. So I went. Um, uh, We can't see the yeah. Um, I started this wonderful. Job. Hello, all. good afternoon. I'm Krupesh Ganatra, <clears throat> based in Thane. So I went. Um, uh, I started this one. i think there is some technical issue with the video yes yeah, sir the team is looking into it just give us a minute sir uh, one of the one uh, other thing i want to do just add 
you know when uh, patients start losing weight or when their uh, sexuality increases like they had on uh, testosterone replacement one of the first things they say is you know the urine has stopped falling on the foot because there's some degree of tumescence and uh, some degree of enlargement what happens when testosterone levels become low uh, the cells in uh, the penis become atopic so the penile size actually decreases and when the testosterone replacement is done that those same cells start growing again so they become bigger they, you don't get a bigger penis but you get a normal one so these patients are actually urinating on themselves and they try their level best to not do so but i think after bariatric surgery and after testosterone replacement you will see the first improvement is they are able to urinate without getting themselves wet it's a really important issue raman i plead to you every time you see a bariatric patient male patient please examine the genitalia and see them after 6 months and one year and examine you will see the difference you will see a marked difference i mean yeah. what an observation dr raman so doctor who would I, have noticed something yes so you know kushal we have a uh, patients who are uh, so obviously i am not examining their genitalia i'll start doing it but uh, uh, patients have been telling me that when they go to loo uh, to a loo the morbidly obese ones they have to take down their trousers or pajamas because they don't know where they are urinating and i mean it's very uh, very very embarrassing in a public toilet because they otherwise they will spoil their uh, uh, clothes so they will have to take out everything before they urinate and uh, sometimes the toilets are not available wcs are not available where they can take it off and it's a it's a awkward situation because they have to take out to be to be uh, able to be so what they do is they press on both sides of the, um, uh, the penis on the pubic part and they press that then then uh, some amount of Uh, the yeah. genital layer comes out and they can pass it okay i think now the video is ready yes so the video is ready so sagar please go ahead sagar can you unmute yourself and from the beginning yeah can please play it from the beginning No. Sagar, it's not coming. The at least I'm not getting the audio. No, no audio. The audio is closed from his end. Sagar is a bariatric surgery patient. Raman. Uh, no, sir. The bariatric patient. It is Mr. Krupesh. This is okay. uh, our media team who's playing the video from his end. I'm so sorry for the technical glitch. Sagar, maybe we can have his audio. You know, now we have seen him. If uh, both of both the things are not playing together, you can have at least the audio going. Correct. Okay. Do you have any questions for bariatric surgeon here, besides all the advice that you gave to me? You're asking me? Yeah. Uh, no, I, the only advice I would give a bariatric surgeon is please think about sexuality. It's a very important. Uh, in fact, I, you tell the patients. I mean, first you have to be convinced yourself that uh, yeah, bariatric surgery improves their sexual dimension. and once you are sure about it yourself not literature but yourself then you can propagate that among patients patients who have hesitancy in getting a surgery done and all will be more motivated but i personally feel they should be more motivated and uh, i have these uh, couples who are both obese and uh, they are having problems and one of the problems uh, you probably have faced is uh, they are having a lot of uh, infection in their uh, abdomen uh, where the fold is there that thick part fold uh, in fact uh, i managed a patient at home who was uh, 250 kg and uh, i asked him one day what was your great wish 
he said you see that door and he was in the living room and the double bed he was occupying all of double bed but my only wish is to stand and to be able to go and cross that door now this was like 20 years back before bariatric surgery he came in the picture maybe he would have got it done and he was a very famous pandit and a lot of people used to come every time i used to go and dress him he had a lot of infection uh, in the abdominal flap uh, because it's always sweating and it's overlapping and uh, um, because of big oh. this the problem was there. so only wish to stand and to go out outside and yeah. if bariatric surgery was there at that time he could have done that we hear he died before that routinely. routinely sagar are you ready please play the video after one i'm kripesh ganatra <clears throat> based in thane so i went um, uh, i started this wonderful journey i went under the knife uh, on the 6th of may uh, 2017 so uh, i mean initially was not very reluctant uh, for the surgery and stuff and i've been obese uh, for my life i mean I mean very obese morbidly obese and unfortunately uh, in that year i lost uh, my uh, parents i mean both of them a very short span of time the gap was very less my father of course uh, the main reason was one of the main reasons of obesity his way the age also was on the lower side so then a lot of i mean thinking was i mean a lot of thinking a lot of brainstorming a lot of issues but still then my immediate family pushed me to go for this uh, uh, surgery and then uh, 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 this is this is this is the background this is how it happened so now it's like almost four and a half years and uh, i met dr goel dr ramin goel i mean uh, i mean i've hardly seen someone you know, i mean a lot of doctors for eternity is uh, so much calm and uh, he i've seen I've, i've never seen him treat me and all his uh, patients like actual patients as in he tries to un- make make us understand the integrities of it and uh, then i think after meeting him the decision for going uh, under the knife i mean for the for the, the gastric sleeve uh, i mean i i could really uh, convince myself that uh, i should take this step and that was necessary because at that time i was 400 pounds so that was almost 180 181 to was the starting weight so that was quite high even though my age was around my 30 or 30 31 i suppose but still i mean <clears throat> the weight was quite high and i had seen recent issues at home so then of course the uh, we the event after the surgery and uh, i i think in the span of around one one and a half years i lost close to 75 kg so that was and my lifestyle before the surgery was like um, even at that 30 31 age i mean i had hardly i could you know take a couple of flows or i hardly i could walk up around 10 15 minutes hardly i could drive for like one or two hours even though state of emergency we had to but then uh, um, i had some you know while sleeping had some issues and stuff but then we don't realize that i'm a very obese very very obese patient so i used to have swelling a bit of swelling on my legs and stuff so that things we ignore but then after the surgery when i actually was going down i could really feel the results i mean so things were getting better and without i i, I was not paying attention that chai ho raha hai so then eventually the weight uh, started coming down when i could walk or when i could swim or when i could really uh, take i stand the top floor on the 10th so so i could really after 6 or 8 months i believe i could um uh, uh, climb my 10th floor on the on my uh, my building where i stay and i really didn't feel no shit i mean it's not possible i mean i'm not feeling that breathlessness uh, which i was earlier i couldn't attempt earlier i mean i, I didn't have the guts to take more than five stories at one point so uh, these are the changes so what happens is once you eventually start losing it after some few months you know and when a person like me who, who was weighing 400 lbs 400 pounds so then you realize the the actual uh, results the actual magic what the surgery does so uh, this this was the journey and uh, the the best part is that i mean even though you are not really uh, so because me being an emotional eater and the food eat and the the metabolic rate was still quite i mean not the, the great so then these the scientific things uh, dr goel 
Madhu ma'am and they just taught me and they, I, I sort of understand, okay, so this is uh, because in my past, I have lost uh, working, I mean, I've lost a lot of kgs, 30, 40 kgs at once while working on the gym in my college days, school days, 40, 40 kgs, and I've then put on 50, 60, 70. So this, these numbers, these variations in a normal person's life is something very huge. Like I say, I have 40 kilo or 70 kilo, 80 kilo, so a normal person will be a little dilemma, it's a shock, what happens, it's a little bit of a shock, it's a little bit of a shock, it's a little bit of a shock, so what happens is, these things are only a person who is of my weight or somewhere around that you really relate to. And basically then, I mean, you, you tend to re understand the whole thing. But one thing which uh, uh, was more important to me is, it's, I mean, somewhere I last year, I mean, last year in lockdown and stuff, so I've been going on, on the higher scale bit. Uh, so what happens is we forget that it's actually a tool. It's, it's just a simple tool. So it's not a life for uh, time survey which can help you maintain and you know even if you can eat less or something like that but then if you use it as a tool so it, it really goes along with somewhere when i got an off track and coming back to the track now so this is basically the background which uh, i mean i feel a, a, a pediatric patient is so you have to uh, even though the proportion is less of your intake but then from not from the, the tongue but from the mind you have to be prepared for that that's it's okay you can at least lead, uh, lead a good life whatever you are and i'm accepting that i had i had gone off track but i'm trying to i'm trying to bring it to a very normal uh, way again a normal lifestyle some workouts because uh, last year unfortunately i mean god's grace uh we were trying since me and my wife uh, to become parents so we could we become parents to two uh twins to twin boys so i mean so we've been running around behind both of them since almost a year they are 16 months old so that's the reason why i could go off track and i had no time i was just paying attention to kids and running around lockdown so there's no need to help so a lot of things so that's the reason i come come to i'm trying to come back so the uh, the the best part here was that uh, uh what happened was earlier uh, so this is the basic uh, background of the whole surgery the whole journey how much i lost and again what's the current scenario coming back to the topic where uh, I'm supposed to just give you a, a small uh, uh, thing is that uh, earlier, uh, I, had, I mean, of course, we have panics because of certain stuff. So the numbers, numbers, I'm not sure uh, perfectly, I don't remember the numbers, but of course, I know the levels, the uh, abnormal levels were completely uh, imbalanced. So uh, like we were trying since almost 2015 and till up to 17 when I met at night, the numbers never came to uh, the normal uh, graph where which is required. Uh, uh, I mean, to, uh, to become a parent on, on my on the male fertility part, and I had lost weight in between. Again, I was working on a lot of medication, but still it couldn't come. But like immediately after the surgery, because we did a lot of tests during the surgery and before the surgery. So after the surgery, the numbers I was just checking every six months. And uh, to be very frank, I think after a year, if I remember in 2018, April, almost a year, the numbers were perfectly in range. So, um, uh, the, the, the testosterone levels, the uh, uh, estrogen, and all, all those stuff. I'm, I'm not very good at those, uh, the, just uh, the names, but to give you the idea. So, the numbers were quite good. So, I was checking regularly. And eventually, uh, what happened was, uh, even though I had to take few, uh, few and help here and there from a local uh, doctor who helped both of us, because she's a bit on the OB side. But then, I think, after that help uh, and the bariatric surgery, which was a major changing uh, uh, game, I mean, a major, uh, major uh, turning event in my life, then we could really uh, see this uh, joy and this uh, lovely uh, journey of being parents. So otherwise, if I would have just done a normal, uh, say, a normal male treatment, fertility treatment, still, I, I think I would have uh, been really able to... Uh, uh, I mean, become a father or something like that. But this surgery definitely helped to normalize the numbers, and then uh, these things help. And then uh, how? I mean, this is how it, uh, the results came out. That's what I meant here. <clears throat> so um, this has definitely helped me a lot, you know. To uh, I mean, to see things which I always wanted to for a few years, experience things, and. Uh, of course, becoming parents are the best part in life. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Krupesh. You were wonderful. Hi, this is Dr. Rundati. Hi, hi, Dr. Yeah, hi. And you pretty much answered everything. So, on your journey. So, there's nothing much for me to ask you, Mark, further. So, <laughs> the 
only right. thing that I would like to ask you is like, how did it affect you psychologically? This entire thing from pre-surgery, then the surgery, post-surgery. How is how has it affected you mentally, psychologically? So yeah, that's a very very important question, and uh, I I mean glad you could ask because I had really skipped this point. Uh, what happens here in India? Back in I mean, periodic surgery still people are not so much. Uh, I mean, <laughs> see me being a social guy, I have a lot of friends, my the business, I have clients. So you know, in in in, in any other country, say US or uh, any other country, there it's very common. I mean, it's 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 a life saving surgery basically. So it's a disease where we're dealing with. But I, I never understood, you know. So of course, in seventeen the things were different. When I met Doctor Goyal, and he's like, um, I mean, I don't know what to describe what he's done to me and to my family, in fact. And he always really keeps on telling me, ah, that if you take a little bit of dad, take a little bit of dad, then you can probably save your dad. That thing always stays here with me. So okay, that was something which was this time. So what happens is. Uh, Before the surgery, I mean, and after the surgery. So before surgery, what you feel is that uh, okay, on the अच्छा इसमें क्या होना है? 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 अच्छा इसम First of all, the first point as I told you is the social uh, point, which uh, to deal with. अच्छा इतना कम हो गया तो क्या तो सर्जरी है क्या? So you know, acceptance is very difficult here. So and again, uh, there are many people still who don't say after the surgery that अच्छा मैंने pediatric कराया और उसके बाद कम हो गया. So what happens is uh, uh, that thing which I feel was uh, a big hitter at that time for me, and um, uh, I feel uh, uh, that was uh, something. Where I was refraining myself from actually uh, going for this thing, that I mean, what will I say? Because I knew results are going to come. Results are going to come. Not so much sure. But that was the one part. So then, after the whole process, I had to make myself mentally uh, prepared. That okay, जो है सो है. It it was done to save my family, myself from all these things. So psychologically, I believe. Uh, We we have to be uh, prepared for that. I mean that this is going to happen. There are many people who say this is not recommended. I mean few of my friends, few of my uh, known people say that they are not doing that. Maybe even they are obese, so they will get something. It will happen. So they are basically scared, uh, not of going on the things going on the other side, but of the social dilemma. That okay, I mean, okay. So I mean, what happens here? Here, I mean, there is no control. So these things they don't understand. It's not about uh, controlling or hunger or something. But it's about your, it's about a metabolic disorder which uh, makes this happen. So even if I'm having food, homely food for six months, and if I have proper food like uh, full of ghee, there still I'm going to oil. Uh, I'm going to put on weight. That's not about the outside food. So you have to understand this is some type of a defect, some type of a uh, some type of a disease which is affecting you, and you have to rectify that. So once that is done, then I think things become easier. So for me, it was definitely earlier, and then. After seeing the results and after, I mean, everything, I had no fear or nothing. I mean, जो है सो है. It is like that. You have to be, you know. See, there is some issue with you. You will definitely get it rectified from the doctor, right? आपको अगर कुछ issue होगा in your body, so you will definitely go to doctor and get it treated. So this is treatment. I mean, some sort of you cannot be living with this. That's what I personally feel. Beautifully answered. I think entirely the uh, your confidence, you know, reflects on the way you talk and the way you tell your story. And I understand that in a country like India, it's not really easy to come and talk about, you know, uh, your uh, obesity and then that the pediatric surgery. I understand the level of acceptance is not up to the mark. But again, mm-hmm. congratulations, uh, Mr. Kupesh. Kudos to you for completing your journey so successfully. And from the entire team of Doc Nexus, we would wish you all the very best to keep continuing to do the same. See, the purpose of us doing this program uh, is that the physicians, basically, you know, that the physicians are watching this program so that they can motivate more and more patients, you know, to come mm-hmm. forward and to accept this. That is why we are doing this. 
thank you so much again thank you. that's why that's why i actually want to sorry to interrupt that's why no, i wanted to actually come out and say that okay I, uh, and they should even realize i mean the patients who they have to make them understand it of course these things go the some or the off track other way also but i mean should not get demoted because i was actually not so much comfortable going to dr goel after uh, this a uh, bit of pain even he understand the situation but then i prepared myself no if i'm going wrong you have to correct it you have to take the take take, take charge of things and then go so even if it goes somewhere here and there don't be don't go on the negative path so it, it, i mean this is this is how it is and always try and take that step immediately once you go wrong so correct. it's okay i accepted that and you have to accept that somewhere okay thank you so much thank you for being here and take care thank you so much take care bye after uh-huh. aman yeah no yeah. we i think prakash was excellent you know yes he is a very good to... communicator yeah so you know i remember distinctly when he came for initial consultation and uh, when he made took the decision it wasn't easy because you know he just lost his parents i remember he came within a week of their parents uh, demise because the family wanted him to survive all right because the father also had the same problem and uh, i said hold on for some time uh, go through the grief period don't get, uh, rush this surgery so fast and uh, you know the very fact that he has realized that surgery is a tool if it is used wisely it gives wonderful results that itself shows that he is back on track you know he has been saying again and again that he went off track in between because he had twins and is blessed with twins but i think now he has realized and this realization comes in patients early many patients have these issues of fertility uh, in men and women both and uh, it's a real pleasure to as you have seen in one of your programs that this lady from kanpur called me up from the operation theater she said i informed my husband first and now you are the second person to know that i have got a child so i think that kind of happiness that we share with our families is a great joy but it's a medical disease infertility and the sexual dysfunction and we need to, which needs to be addressed one of the way to address them is bariatric surgery in people who require them uh, kushal you wanted to say something yeah yeah i think uh, to conclude uh, i would uh, request dr goy to do three things oh god one i e i i e f that is international index of erectile dysfunction Uh, have a have a uh, paper on it and let paper uh, patients answer second serum testosterone in the morning between 8 to 10 and third semen analysis for all patients before surgery and repeat it after one and i think uh, you have opened my eyes also about uh, sperm counts which i never knew would increase but yes uh, you uh, even the, the patient said the same thing so i would definitely want to know the results how how they improve after bariatric surgery that's really interesting thank you for that information sure thank you so much thank you dr raman thank you dr kushal for being here for taking out okay. the time thank you and that's many that's thanks it. to mr krupesh and i think he patients like this uh their testimonies add a lot of value to our program and i we have been receiving a lot of you know comments that uh, they lot of physicians are asking questions and getting interested congratulations dr raman congratulations dr kushal good work okay. thank you kudos okay. to you good night thank you good night sir okay. thank you viewers please stay connected for the next session next thursday till then stay safe happy doctor session